Could I ask the next group to hustle on up, please? Hustle, hustle. Uh, while they're walking up, I really would like to thank um, Sarah Foley, who is working our AV for us. Thank you. And I'd like to also thank the Buildings and Grounds crew and the Cooper Union staff who helped make this event possible tonight. I don't think our next speaker needs very much of an introduction, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Here's Peter Buckley. Seven minutes. <laughs> The last time I spoke to a meeting like this, almost all of the questions about the history of the mission but were about matters of current governance, especially about the role of the tr trustees. I presume that the questions were rooted in a general frustration about who's running this place. And the record of the last three weeks has not clarified much. Two trustees have resigned. We've had a past president publicly questioning the policy proposals of the current president and cautioning against tactics of financial transparency. And we have trans trustees wonderfully silent on the record of the previous administration. So who is running Cooper Union and who's to blame for its current condition? I can give you a historical answer to the first question. Uh, among the many wonderful qualities of our founder was his genuine and persistent naivete when it came to politics. <laughs> He really thought that a modern democratic republic could produce a set of informed, intelligent, disinterested leaders who would govern with a clear notion of the public good before them at all times. And he was surprised and perplexed by the rise of the two-party system and the professional politicians who accompanied it. His first foray into public life, his role as a trustee of the public school society, was marked by all kinds of disappointment the Public School Society was a body that controlled all of the funds for New York City's public schools. But it was not a branch of the city's government. It was a private body of apparently wise, disinterested men charged with the oversight of public funds. For Cooper, there was no problem about this. Indeed, it only made sense that as one advanced in years and experience, you gain the idea of the public good. And that would be able to discount private interest something that an elected politician or a bureaucrat would never be able to do. Well, the society became totally unglued because of accusations by the city's growing Catholic population that public funds were being used by a private Protestant leadership clique to inculcate Protestant forms of education. Why couldn't public funds be used to support Catholic parochial schools? This was justified as it is today by phrases such as parental choice. Cooper was totally unprepared for this political onslaught and theological polarization. The public school was disbanded, the Board of Education was founded, and Cooper decided to continue the work, in a sense, under his own auspices. Why not have a new educational program, he said, that used private wealth and trusteeship for the public good? Hence, Cooper Union was founded on the ashes of the old public school society. Cooper initially devised a very odd form of trusteeship for this place. It was to have New York City's mayor, the editor of the New York Post newspaper, <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe its owner, uh, himself and, and, and three old members of the public school society. It was a hopeless mishmash of public and private interest, or rather Cooper couldn't see where the private ended and the public began. This was his glorious ideal and his legal lunacy. New York State rejected the initial charter for this school because it was a private charity with elected officials on the board. The second charter, which was approved, named six friends and family members, including decisively his son-in-law, Abraham Hewitt. Hewitt and the board ran the operations of Cooper Union directly for the first 40 years of our existence. Indeed, there was no change in board membership for the first 25 years, an extraordinary record. In keeping with many 19th century uh, philanthropies, the board looked in detail at operating expenses and also chose the course of instruction to be offered 
and directly hired faculty. Hewitt knew everything about this place. He wrote letters about heating and ventilation issues even when he served as New York City's mayor. The trustees were invested literally in the operating budget because they were collectively accountable for any operating deficit, and this continued through the 1960s. The president, <laughs> but, but that stopped since. The president of the Cooper Union uh, was the president of the Board of Trustees all the way through to 1938 when Edwin Sharp Burdell arrived to bring Cooper Union into the 20th century some 40 years late. The previous operating officer had been called a director. With Burdell's arrival, the title of president migrated to someone responsible for professionalizing the faculty, for adjusting Cooper's academic program to match national standards, not local charitable conditions. The trustees began to take a back seat in operations, as did some of the school's advisory boards who had a hand in recommending courses and teachers. Well, that process has continued, so now it'd be next to unthinkable for a trustee to interfere with the academic operations at the level of the course or in the hiring of staff. Instead, most educational institutions operate with the parameters of shared governance. The college has a dual track system of authority and responsibility, which presumes that faculty members are best qualified to chart the university's educational course, while administrators are most competent to direct its finances and organization. In practice, these domains should be overlapping and interdependent. To function successfully together, faculty, administrations, and trustees should depend on a high degree of consultation, trust, mutual respect, and of course, collegiality. The trustees, um, meanwhile, I suppose, are responsible for upholding the stated mission of the institution. Whereas corporate governance, the board is responsible to the shareholders. In nonprofits, the board is responsible to the stakeholders in that declared mission, the faculty, alumni, staff, and students. They are the ones <laughs> who sign, who charter the governance documents. At Cooper, each faculty has a document that specifies the responsibilities over curriculum, hiring committees, and administration. Well, I wish I could end there. I should end there. But of course, the language about, about trust and respect has to be phrased in the conditional sense. Historically, shared governance has not been easy to maintain or to enact here. Indeed, managerial prerogatives over budgets and hirings, the selling off of Green Camp, getting rid of physics, led to the creation, among other things, of the faculty union in the 1970s. I think, and to sum up, it's not antagonism that now marks the relations between the trustees, the administration, and the faculty, but increasing distance. Maybe the new president can do something about this, but I think the evidence of the last few decades suggests it'll be very difficult to achieve.